Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with our third 12 Days of Christmas special, and it's a whodunit. Horror Babble presents There Were Twelve of Us to Begin With. A man drives into a blizzard atop the remote hills of the Peak District. It's Boxing Day, and he's on his way home following a Christmas spent with family. But the weather's getting worse, and in order to avoid losing control of the car, he's forced to find a place in which to wait out the storm. His search leads him to the sprawling Miller's Manor on the outskirts of Miller's Dale, wherein an unusual murder mystery event is taking place. Much to his chagrin, he soon finds himself an unwilling participant in what quickly becomes apparent as no ordinary game. There are twelve episodes in total, folks, airing daily from today through to January 6th. Will you be able to identify the game's mastermind before the story has run its course? Be sure to leave your comments below. This year's special is dedicated to our supporters on Patreon and Bandcamp, without whom this mammoth endeavour simply wouldn't have been possible. And a special thanks goes out to all of our YouTube subscribers, as well as those who have supported us in other ways throughout the year. Horror Babble really wouldn't amount to much without you guys. And without further ado... There Were Twelve of Us to Begin With, by Ian Gordon. With thanks to our producers, Ashley Lindsay, Robert Daniel Picard, Wes Sale, and Cameron Seegers. The cottage hearth beams warm and bright, the candles gaily glow, the stars emit a kinder light above the drifted snow. Down from the sky a magic steals to glad the passing year, and belfries sing with joyous peals for Christmas Tide is here. H.P. Lovecraft, Christmas. Chapter 1 Blue Bottle, December 13th, 2019. There were twelve of us to begin with, said Richard Ike, the sole survivor of the Miller's Manor Massacre, a string of murders committed within the walls of the mansion of the same name over the twelve days of Christmas, 1989-90. His interlocutor was Annabelle Franklin, a first-time author, keen to pick the brains of the one who got away, the only one, he who outwitted the murderous mastermind at the eleventh hour, at the cost of three fingers and his right foot. Now, some thirty years later, I could finally agree to share his story with Franklin, on the basis that nothing be omitted— that his account would be both meticulous and gruesome, that it was important to him that the truth be told. As to why it was so important to the wounded survivor, the mastermind, the individual behind the murders, had never been caught. I could lived in fear since his dramatic escape all those years earlier, thirty years spent looking over his shoulder, limping from destination to destination, afraid of his own shadow. The publication of Franklin's book would be his catharsis, closure at last. Franklin had hounded Ike for years. She, representative of the masses and their insatiable need for enlightenment, had obsessed over the case ever since it came to light in the first weeks of 1990. Rumours had abounded for decades, and, in true grapevine fashion, the general public, aided by the ravenous media, had greatly exaggerated the statements Ike gave during the initial police investigation, transforming his bare-boned comments into wild, nonsensical anecdotes involving would-be boogeymen and supernatural phenomena. Eventually, though, common sense prevailed, and the public grew to accept the basic facts in the case. The tragic deaths of several innocent people, the fortuitous survival of the last would-be victim, and a killer on the loose. Outside of official circles, the case still an open investigation in the eyes of the police, only Ike had the ability to shed light on what had happened over those twelve bleak days. And there they were, the writer and her most sought-after subject, face to face in the quietude of Ike's Nottingham home, engaged in conversation. Franklin, her aging face a mask of determination, 
and Ike, a bundle of nerves, his chin in his hands, on the left of which only a thumb and forefinger remained. The sole survivor's account had begun with the well-documented story of his happening upon the now legendary murder mystery event at Miller's Manor on December 26, 1989. A single, twenty-seven-year-old at the time, Ike had spent Christmas Day with his parents in Macclesfield, a relatively short drive across the Peak District from his home in Chesterfield. The journey had become something of a tradition, with Ike heading across Christmas Eve and returning Boxing Day. Other than the Christmas of eighty-four, the winter he'd finally managed to convince his neighbour, Lisa Rogers, to go out with him, he'd made the trip every year without fail. And so it was that Ike was driving in the direction of Millersdale, near Buxton, on Boxing Day 89, when the sprinkling of snow that had been forecast started to come down in broad, disorientating sheets. He'd braved the route in the snow many times before, but on this occasion there was something particularly menacing about the way in which the white, ghostly veils descended, threatening to lure him off the poorly lit highway into the heart of the barren snowscape that was forming about him. Admitting defeat, the twenty-seven-year-old abandoned the A6 on the approach to Taddington, and made a slow, painstaking way along the back roads of Millersdale, until, finally, and somewhat inexplicably, he found himself traversing the snow-covered track that led to the remote Miller's Manor. Miller's Manor is a large, red-brick Georgian mansion, southwest of the small settlement of Millersdale, a mere stone's throw from the banks of the River Wye. It was built circa 1750 by the Countess Mary James of the highly influential James family, who had been in ownership of the substantial acreage upon which it was constructed for centuries. In the late 1960s, following the death of the last surviving member of the James line, Miller's Manor was acquired by a private investor, who, up until the tragedy that beset the estate, had frequently let the property as a venue hire facility in which low-budget horror films were shot throughout the seventies, and murder mystery events were hosted throughout the eighties. And it was into an unconventional example of the latter that the young Richard Ike unwittingly stumbled that fateful snowy night in December eighty-nine. Noticing a number of vehicles adorning the vast driveway, the twenty-seven-year-old parked alongside what, from its outline beneath a dusting of snow, appeared to be a beetle, and emerged from his rust-bucket cortina in order to make a dash for the manor. He might have felt preposterously out of his depth as he approached the red-brick monstrosity, its ornate sash windows and grand portico festooned by the advancing blizzard, but, being familiar with the area, he knew of the mansion and its present-day usage. He was certain that the event participants, or guests within, would relate to his plight, and grant him a room in which to wait out the ever-intensifying whiteout. He wouldn't mind paying for the privilege, either. Stepping into the shelter of the portico, Ike rapped on the heavy wooden door, and waited. Several moments later, the door was opened, revealing the magnificent interior, in which two befuddled men met his gaze. The warmth of the manor rushed out to greet him, as one of the men, a tall, dark-haired individual in jeans and a beige turtleneck sweater, gestured for Ike to step inside. In the man's shadow, stood a shorter, smartly-dressed fellow in a colourful fair isle cardigan over a white shirt and black tie, his face empty of expression. Ike crossed the threshold and stepped into the calm shelter of Miller's Manor's Grand Hall. He was about to tell of his predicament, when the taller of the two men raised a forefinger to his lips and pointed in the direction of a door across the hall. Thinking nothing of it, the twenty-seven-year-old moved towards the indicated portal, admiring the opulence and sheer scale of the hall and its towering Christmas tree as he went. There was an eerie silence about the place, distinct, even above the howling blizzard outside, the sort of stillness that owes its presence to expectancy. And, as Ike stepped into the adjacent room, a large reception hall, he understood the source of that unspoken anticipation. Occupying different positions throughout the room, were nine additional men and women, the heads of whom were tilted in the direction of the doorway, evidently greatly interested as to the identity of the latecomer. Ike stepped into the room proper, and was unsurprised to observe a freestanding signpost in the southwest corner, labelled, Murder at Miller's Manor, December 26, 1989, to January 6, 1989. 
1990. His instincts had been correct. The 27-year-old had interrupted a planned event, one of the many murder mystery events that took place at the estate every year. The two men who had admitted him entered the reception hall to his rear, and then Ike, without hesitation, offered an explanation for his unanticipated arrival. In response to this, a young woman with dark brown hair stepped forward, an attractive lady in a bright yellow dress, and spoke to him directly. "'But we've been expecting you,' she said, in a tone of voice that suggested his arrival at the mansion was anything but chance. "'Me?' Ike returned, perplexed. "'Yes, your name's in the hat,' the woman in yellow continued, pointing towards a sandalwood bureau on the north wall. Frowning, Ike approached the white top hat sitting upturned on the bureau and picked it up. Inspecting its contents, he found a tiny ball of crumpled paper. He unfurled it. "'Blue bottle?' he read aloud questioningly, looking back at the other guests, several of whom had moved towards him curiously. "'That's your name?' This from the tall man who had answered the door. "'My name?' "'Your code name,' the woman in yellow offered. Ike shook his head in frustration. "'Look,' he began, "'I had to get off the A6 due to the weather, "'and this was the first place I stumbled across. "'I was hoping you'd be able to put me up for a couple of nights.' "'There was a moment of silence. "'Oh,' muttered the tall man. "'Again, silence prevailed for several seconds. "'Well,' the woman in yellow said, "'since you're here—' Annabel Franklin listened as Ike related the circumstances surrounding his decision to participate in the murder mystery event, stating that he willingly partook under the proviso that he be given a room of his own, a proviso that, quite inexplicably, had already been fulfilled in anticipation of a twelfth guest, the very guest he himself had been mistaken for. Minutes after his code name had been revealed, a glass of brandy had been wafted under his nose, and the twelve of them, existing contestants and stranger alike, had enjoyed a quiet drink together by the roaring fire that dominated the south wall. It wasn't quite the evening the twenty-seven-year-old had had in mind when he left his parents' place earlier that day, but perhaps serendipity had presented an opportunity he'd never have seized under normal circumstances. Perhaps a murder mystery event designed to challenge the intellect of twelve strangers was precisely the kind of thing Richard Ike would enjoy given half the chance. And so, it simply remained for him to acquaint himself with the rules of the game, and the dispositions of the other guests. Thanks for listening today, ladies and gents. Be sure to join us again tomorrow night at 8pm Eastern Time, for the next part of There Were Twelve of Us to Begin With. And until then, 